My name's Connie Fowler, and I came here with my husband in 1974. And we were both from the area, sort of. He was raised in Ashland, and I was raised in Grants Pass. Okay. And I was always familiar with the Applegate and loved it, and through him found Little Applegate, and then found Buncombe. Yeah. And we live just three and three tenths miles around the corner from Buncombe on Little Applegate, okay. and uh, have been there since 1974. As we met neighbors, we became more aware that these little buildings had some significance, and I think we knew about the post office. But the the, the buildings, the little like, clapboard building that is the post was the post office, and the lady that owned the property wouldn't let anybody do anything to preserve it, and in fact, it had sat there for all those years and never burned to the ground or anything. And they, you know, she had let people live in it. You know, you know, kind of a stopover um, for a while, you know, and she um, was basically didn't want anybody on her property, you know, doing anything with it. And we, we all were upset about that and wondered about it. Are they going to be saved or are they going to fall apart? And um, there was just something about the fact that it was still there on a crossroads and, and that it, we've, we knew that it had historical s significance and also a certain amount of emotional significance. Right. So what did you do? The property was sold to, the, to Reeve and Lynn Hinion, uh -huh. and I believe that was 1991, and they were very excited about preserving the buildings. Mm -hmm. And so a group of us started the Buncombe Historical Society and uh, began to do nothing but keep the buildings in, a, we like to say, a state of arrested decay. In other words, we don't want them to fall down, but we don't want them to look like Disneyland either. So, right. yeah. And what was your involvement in that? Well, we could name our own uh, position in the. Well, the beginning was just a town council, uh -huh. and you know, with humor, we were able to name ourselves. So I'm the. I was the town crier because I could write. Um, one person was the sheriff, and one person was the um, master of building or whatever, I can't remember exactly. And um, <clears throat> then we decided to actually create a, a historical society. And um, we don't, we, we ask people to join if they wanted to. And uh, we sold memberships for $5 a family and to raise the money to help, you know, keep the buildings in repair, but mainly just so that people could feel like a part of the whole thing. And so um, we ended up with over 300 people from all over the world, actually, because uh, some of the, the new people would have their friends, either, either their friends had been to Buncombe or they said, you should you know, belong to this. It's, it's really a cool thing to do. <laughs> and then subsequently, through the Southern Oregon Historical Society, we wrote the book about the history of Buncombe. Yeah. You authored the book? I co-authored the book with J.B. Roberts, and J.B. was a, a transplanted uh, person but was very interested in history, and he wrote the, what was going on at the time mm -hmm. in the country and in the world, and then I wrote about the down-home, what's going on with the people and who they were and what they did. And I had that need to do that or that urge to do it when we first moved there, but I never got around to it. And a lot of the old people died and I was fortunate to get some of them and uh, to find uh, some of the history through the historical society and through people that knew the people that were living, not living at Buncombe, but in the area. Right. So what was that research process like? That was interesting. I did some um, it took, research takes a lot of time, obviously, and that fun part was going and, and visiting with the people. To me, the hard part is sitting down and, and writing about it, you know, and, and to write a book seemed 
monumental because I'd written lots of personal profiles and in some publications, but not a book. So that was, you know, kind of dragging your feet, trying to say, well, how am I going to do this? And so, uh, and in the book, we his his writing about the history of or the uh, current events, more or less, at that time, <coughs> is written separately from mine. And uh, but anyway, it was it was hard to work the fun like I said the fun part was talking to the people and getting their stories and, and I knew them a lot of them so that helped who, who all did, was it just a bunch of people that had been in the area for a long time mm -hmm. yeah the salt marshes the uh, there were some people that um, would refer me and we still get people showing up at Buncombe Day t saying well my dad used to live here my mom cooked in that building and even the other day, a guy came and he says, my grandfather worked on that building in 1930 or something. And so that's always kind of fun. And we try to get that documented, but, you know, they get away from us. And it's and, and you wonder, when I had a guy, a man saw my number on the building, but had no cell service out there. So he, his son called me and he said, my dad wants to come and talk to you. He lived in what we know as the cookhouse in 1930s because there was a resurgence of the gold rush in the 30s during the depression and people were desperate for some way to make a living and so they came from the Willamette Valley a lot of times because they'd gone up there originally to to mine and then they came, would come back down here some of them and he came so he came out of the house he was 91 he had lived at Buncombe for, I believe he said, two years. And um, he, his parents just left the Willamette Valley. They had no means of making a living. And so they came down here and they just moved in. And they tried to mine. And he ran up a bill, I think he said, of $45 at the Roosh store that they had in Roosh. And this was a huge amount of money in those days. And he couldn't pay it. So he packed the kids up and went back to the Willamette Valley. And this man was very um, eager to see if he could find a relative to pay back what he had owed. But of course, it was hard to run anybody down. We didn't pursue it. And he since passed away. But he had become a pilot and just a really nice person. But that had bothered him for all those years. There was a um, lady called me one time. She'd gotten my number from something. And she lived in Klamath Falls. And she said, we had no clue where Buncombe was. And she said, my son is a, a historian, and I am too. And he works at the landfill in Klamath Falls. And so he was digging around in the trash looking for whatever. And he came up with this doll chest. And it's approximately 14, 18 inches by maybe seven or eight. And I'll, we could even have a picture of it if you wanted it. And um, cardboard with a little wood around it. And she said it was just full of postcards and letters postmarked Buncombe, 1909, 1910, 1912. And so she said we had no clue where it was. And so she said the, um, the, the Klamath Falls paper, the AP had done an article and maybe that's where she got my number. And here was Buncombe, Oregon, and she was really excited about it, so she called and she said, would you guys want that? Well, no. <laughs> yeah, so we said, yeah, sure. And she said, well, I want to show it at the Thule Lake Fair, but then I'll send it to you, and she did. She followed through, sent us the doll chest, and um, I, can, I will have some of the postcards for you to see. And uh, so those are things I think that happen sometimes when you're doing uh, research on a project. You know, I don't know about you, but you know, something will show up out of nowhere. I mean, how could anybody find that in the trash? And what had happened, the lady who was receiving these postcards or sending them was Grace Buck, and she had married Mr. Heckham and he was from Klamath Falls. Oh. And that's how it ended up in Klamath Falls. And so she must have kept it, you know, as a kid, and, and then when she got married, she, and then, of course, when he died, they probably, kids probably went, we don't need that. Did you go through the postcards? Oh, yeah. She, in fact, the lady had them, the woman that sent them to us had them cataloged, actually, and I've since then, they're 
every which way, but, um, and there were some letters in there. There was a, a dress that she had made, and uh, I don't know what vintage it was, because, you know, she could have made it later in life. I don't know, it was pretty small. Um, just, and the, the Buck, there were two Buck families in the area, and we, we figured out which one it was, and so. What was the general content of letters, just day-to-day -day conversations? Yeah, um, just conversations about, um, I think one of them, some of them are from her brother, who was in World War I, and uh, we've read some of them, and, and then the postcards were just little you know, chitty chats and interesting. They would some of them were never postmarked, so the other was either were put into a letter or were never sent. But many of them there was. We have postmarks from Rouge, uh, the little towns that aren't there anymore. Copper, um, Crump. Um, there was a school at um, Little Applegate School, and then and they were all approximately three or four miles apart because kids had to ride or walk so to school. So anyway, yeah. that's the doll chest story. <laughs> well, I was thinking this morning, I don't know who owned the property for, before Mrs. Hugel, but Buncombe was never, it was a census area, and at one time they believed there was probably 1,500 miners living in that area in tents or, you know, just out on the ground, and they would um, they would mine <laughs> they mined along the creeks originally, and uh, Sterling Creek runs right by little or right by or through Buncombe, so they they would uh, go back and forth between the Sterling Creek area and Buncombe area, and um, and then the as that along the river played out, you know, and was not as easy to find, then they started working up the hills, and that's when they came, started using the um, power, the nozzles, the giants, they called them, to blast out the hillsides. And, and there's lots of evidence of that up and down the creeks. Do you know approximately what era that was when it was founded? What time? that? Yeah. That was the middle 1800s, when when Buncombe was a, six, a census area, and when it began to show up on the maps. And um, then they, the post office was well. Actually, after they, uh, a lot of the miners stayed around, and then they became farmers, and they farmed in the the uh, hillsides there. And then they would mine when they weren't farming, and they. Um, so they eventually they needed a post office, so they established a post office in 1896, and the mail would come from Jacksonville over the hill by by stage, um, probably by wagon, two times a week, and people would come down to Buncombe Post Office to get their mail. And originally it was across the road in a house. And the house burned, and they built this little clapboard house that's there now, or building and eventually moved it across the road. The other two buildings supposedly came from another mine downriver called the Federal Mine, and that was in the early 30s, or even possibly a little before. And so a lot of the, the miners stayed around and, and just, you know, they became a community of sorts, but there was never a town. It was just a crossroads, it was just a, they had a little store in the post office, they did Maybe they'd have stick candy and flour and sugar and staples. And yeah. Do you know what was the main uh, route from Jacksonville to Buncombe? Was it? Sterling it was the. It was the Sterling Creek, okay. uh, over the mountain, I guess. The, yeah. Yeah, because Little Applegate Road did it existed, but it was just to access people's homes and. Okay. In fact, there were eight fords across the river. They didn't have bridges. Were there, uh, were there any particular bright spots in, in this project that you had? Anything in the project? That you to <laughs> well, Buncombe Day is probably what we consider the fun, day, fun thing. And we started this, well, this year was the 25th anniversary of the Buncombe Historical Society. But Buncombe, but Buncombe Day, there were a few years that we took off. But um, 
we've, we've said all along that Buncombe is really a state of mind and, um, and that it's a community and what's, what's unique is that the people who have come in from other areas are the ones that want to be community because they didn't even know their neighbors in the city. But they've retired and come here and they want that connection. They don't, it's not that they want to full time hang out, but they want that connection and we have phone trees for fire and different things that uh, are important that we didn't have when we came. I mean, we had two party phone and we didn't, uh, yeah, <laughs> and there was an, um, an old pumper truck at Roosh that was, it took a half an hour to get to our house and the neighbor's house, got, you probably won't use this, but the neighbor's house caught on fire and the loggers had it out, bucket brigade, before the pumper truck ever got there. <laughs> and now they can get there in 10, 15 minutes. But um, I think, yeah, in the whole process of, doing, of being there and doing the book was to see how Buncombe evolved from this just a pile of boards to something that means something to somebody. Yeah. And Buncombe Day is? It's usually, well, now it's the last Saturday of May. This year it fell on Memorial Day um, weekend. And we have two or three hundred people on the average come out. We had a, in, for the centennial of the post office, we had probably 2,500 people go through there and the, the um, post office brought their postmaster out and he did a cancellation that we had designed and, and it was a blast. But I think the main thing that, that people are looking for, I always say, and in the book I said something about there's still gold in them, their hills, but that's not what the people are looking for. They just want the hills, they want the aesthetics, they want to look at, you know, the mountains and and, and they're concerned. They want to keep the water clean and they want to keep, you know, things. They, they know you can't go back, but you can maybe bring along a little bit of, of history with you, you know, or into your presence. Right. And hopefully that would make people, you know, more aware of what it might have been like in a simpler time. It was hard. Yeah. No doubt about that. but. But it was a, a simpler time. I think, you know, it's just interesting. And I've always been interested in, in history, so.